Another episode of Genesis. My name is Jonathan Chan. I'm so glad that you can join me today as we embark on Genesis chapter 34. You know what? On behalf of Dan and I, thank you so much for continuing with us in this journey through Genesis. Actually, for those of you who are attending Crucible Church, the one that I pastor, to all those who are at Crucible, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for continuing to meet with us over Zoom. I'm uh, on behalf of Dan and I and Camille. We just so appreciate and so blessed to see your faces every Sunday on Zoom. You have many choices out there because of the digital world. You could choose any church you wanted to go to. You could watch whatever sermon you want. We're just so thankful that you're there uh, on every Sunday attending worship service with us. And also your faithful giving. This has been a challenging year for many nonprofits and churches. And uh, I have a lot to say about that and a lot of uh, good news uh, and blessings to share with you at our AGM. And so uh, I'll leave that at the AGM. But for now, I just want to say from the from behalf of Dan, Camille and myself, and also the board, thank you for your generous and faithful giving throughout this whole year. Through thick and thin, through many challenging times, through uncertainty in our employment, it's amazing to see how faithful each of us at Crucible Church gave to the church for the work of God's kingdom. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you for your ongoing support. And God blesses those who honor him. And so I pray that God will bless you and shower you with many blessings in 2021. All right, let's go. Genesis chapter 34. All right, before we begin customarily, we uh, show you a video clip. And so let me show you this video clip. So sit back, relax and enjoy the clip and we'll be right back. Hey, what the hell? Put the money in the bag. get away with my money. I missed the part where that's my problem. Jacker, he's been shot. Look, we just called the paramedics. They're on their way. Hey, hey, stay back. Uncle Ben? Uncle Ben? The scene I showed you was from the origin story of Spider-Man. I think this was the first one. Uh, Peter Parker, with super strength and powers from this radioactive spider, lets a thief go by him, which he then learns that the same thief killed his uncle on the same night. It's a dramatic consequence of a very common human attitude when we see a problem. When we see injustice or something that is wrong, uh, many, uh, actually many psychologists and psychiatrists have actually coined the phrase called bystanding. Many of us are bystanders. When we see injustice or advocacy groups that are fighting for against this injustice, more often we, especially 
the everyday Christian. Sit on the sidelines and become bystanders as opposed to further understand what's going on in this world. What's going on with the injustice? What's going on with the world today so that we can be part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem? And so we wonder why we bystand. We wonder why we just sit on the sidelines because we can't just say, hey, we have our lives to deal with, kids to look after, jobs to do, fun activities that we want to enjoy, because that would sound awfully selfish, wouldn't it? But then, maybe it's true. Maybe it is that, that, that we have our own lives to deal with, and that maybe we think to ourselves, oh, we don't have the capacities, or we don't have the ability or expertise to engage with this topic, or maybe it's just unsafe in general. Oh, by the way, uh, I spoke in this topic about homelessness and private property and business property at a previous IMCO, so I invite you to watch that. And many times, back to the point, and many times when we see this injustice, when we see things going wrong in this world or even in our neighborhoods, we go, well, maybe not this time, but maybe when the kids grow up, then I will tackle this. Or maybe when I retire, I will tackle this. And folks, from the baby boomers who share with me, no, there's never the right time. The time is now. So what's keeping us from engaging in these issues, in the injustices that we see in the world, in our city, in our neighborhoods, heck, even in our families? What's keeping us from doing stuff and just remain on the sidelines and become a bystander. Here is my point today. In the movie Spider-Man, this phrase has become the staple throughout Spider-Man's life. Some of you keeners out there who are followers of Spider-Man would know what phrase I'm talking about. With great power comes, you guessed it, great responsibility. Christians, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior and become saved ones in Christ, we, like Jacob in the Bible, have a great responsibility, a God-given responsibility with God-given capacities, i.e. the Holy Spirit, to fulfill those responsibilities. I argue for this morning that if we do not fulfill our God-given responsibility and leave the world to fend for themselves, there will always be a zero sum, i.e. someone loses. In fact, historically, when Christians were bystanding while the world tries to deal with the injustice, things didn't turn out well. Chaos ensues. Here's a recent example. Globally, look at the Arab Spring. And if you don't know what the Arab Spring is, please Google it. It's time for you to get up to speed. And locally, we still haven't figured out how to reconcile with our indigenous neighbors. So many things we want to propose, so many things we want to do, yet every solution seems to have a zero sum. Someone loses. Where are the Christians? Where is the gospel? Where is Jesus in this? Where are his agents intervening so that there will never be a zero sum result? My point is this, following Jesus comes great responsibility. Following Jesus comes great responsibility. And if we don't fulfill it, and if we allow the world, or we just let the world fend for themselves, chaos ensues. All right, let's begin in the end of chapter 33, because in the end of chapter three, it sets the stage for what's to come in chapter 34. So let's begin with chapter 33, verse 18. Later, having traveled all the way from Padam Aram, remember the whole Laban thing? Jacob arrived safely at the town of Shechem in the land of Canaan. There he set up camp outside the town. Jacob bought the plot of land where he camped from the family of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver. And there he built an altar and named it El Elohe Israel. 
Hmm? Wait a minute. Quickly, we know that Jacob forgot his vow he made with God back when he had a watershed moment in chapter 28. Do you guys recall? Jacob was to return to where? Bethel. He was supposed to go to Bethel to build an altar there and give God a tenth of everything. For those of you who may have forgotten that, go back to chapter 28. He made a vow to God that once everything settles down, when he has a family and when he gets wealth, he, he promised God that he would go back to Bethel, build an altar there, worship him, and give a tenth to God. What do we see here? He didn't do any of it. Instead, he settles very close to Shechem in the land of Canaan, a godless city that does not have the same faith nor the moral code as Jacob. Now, do you recall who else camped near a godless city and got himself into trouble earlier in Genesis? You got it. Lot, Abraham's nephew. How these guys don't learn from their family members is quite baffling. So Jacob is already setting himself up for trouble. Not only did he break his vow with God to return to Bethel, he also opened himself up to the possibility of moral compromise and moral blindness due to mingling with godless influence just like Lot. Let's jump into chapter 34 now. Verse 1. One day, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went to visit some of the young women who lived in the area. Now, this is the NLT. The ESV says the young women of the land. Of the land. But when the local prince Shechem, son of Hamar, the Hivite, saw Dinah, he seized her and raped her. But then he fell in love with her. And he tried to win her affection with tender words. He said to his father, Hamor, get me this young girl. I want to marry her. All right, there's so many things that are wrong with that uh, passage, but let's move on. Quote, unquote, Shechem says, young girl. How old was Dinah? The Hebrew for young girl that was used here is yalda, which means marriageable girl, which Bruce Walkie and other scholars would say Dinah was between the ages of 15 and 18. So, Dinah, you're in the foreign land, and you're bored. Okay, we get that. You head out to the nearby town and see if you can meet up new friends. You know, networking. What's wrong with that, you ask? Well, back in those days, a lot. Bruce Walkie said this in his commentary. Quote, this is an improper and imprudent act, meaning dumb. Girls of marriageable age would not normally leave a rural encampment to go unchaperoned into an alien city. Rebecca and Rachel going to a well owned by the clan is quite different from going out unchaperoned among the Canaanites. Jacob has not modeled appropriate distancing from the Canaanites and possibly has influenced Dinah's inappropriate friendliness with them. It is his responsibility to see that she is chaperoned. The lifestyles of Canaanite women repulse Abraham, Isaac, and Rebecca, if you recall about Esau's marriages. So, not only was Dinah not supposed to venture alone into a foreign city, but she was not supposed to mingle with folks who do not share the same page as her, i.e. morals, faith, godliness, etc. Yet, just like Walkie said, Dinah was probably not taught that she was not to mingle with folks not on the same page as her because, hey, dad's not doing it. He's fine being campy with the Canaanite city. We're so close. So she goes off alone into Shechem and gets seen, gets taken violently, and gets raped by Shechem, the prince. Who then, without any apology or remorse for what he did, without any acknowledgement for defiling Dinah and her family, he falls in love with her and wants to marry her. Hmm, does true love really wipe all wrongs? Not in this case. And the author stresses the point that his dad is now part of this story and plays a significant role as an instrument for Shechem to get Dinah as his wife. So it's a father-son duel here. So here's the first lesson we get. 
The consequences of Jacob disobeying his vow to God, not taking decisive action to turn back to God, but rather mingle too close to those who are not on the same page as him in faith and morals, by doing so, dulled his senses along with his family's senses of what's right and what's wrong. Dinah didn't know that she was not supposed to go to foreign land and mingle with him because quite frankly, in her family, no one knew. Verse 5. Soon, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter, Dinah. But since his sons were out in the fields herding his livestock, he said nothing until they returned. Hamar, Shechem's father, came to discuss the matter with Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the field as soon as they heard what had happened. They rushed back, all of them. They were shocked and furious that their sister had been raped. Shechem had done a disgraceful thing against Jacob's family, something that should never be done. Make note of disgraceful. Jacob heard and did nothing. In fact, we learn later that Dinah has been trapped inside Shechem's house during this whole chapter. So she hasn't been back home yet until she was later freed by her brothers. Think about it. You were seen, you were taken, you were raped, and then you were locked in some guy's house, a stranger's house. Now, the Hebrew word for defiled and disgrace is tama, which means more than just guilt is to be unclean sexually, unclean religiously, and a disgrace and an outcast of a family from one's people, which has huge implications back then for Dinah's future, right? Whether it be having kids, whether it be having a life in a, with a family and a life in Jacob's family. She's unclean now. Shechem took her dignity and human value away from her. That's what it means by being defiled. And Jacob did nothing. Whereas Jacob's sons were furious. All of them, all 12 sons were furious. And the author here doesn't side with Jacob's passivity, but agrees with the boy's reaction. Here's the question then. What happens when the person who was given the God-given responsibility and the God-given capacity to look after and protect his household, to protect and remain holy for God's purposes, and were given God-given capacities to do so, shirks away from his responsibilities. Others take over with ungodly consequences. Let's move on to verse 8. Hamor tried to speak with Jacob and his sons. My son Shechem is truly in love with your daughter. <laughs> then why do you lock her up? He said, please let him marry her. In fact, let's arrange other marriages too. What? You give us your daughters for our sons and we will give you our daughters for your sons and you may live among us. The land is open to you. Settle here and trade with us and feel free to buy property in the area. Then Shechem himself spoke to Dinah's father and brothers. Please be kind to me and let me marry her, he begged. I will give you whatever you ask. No matter what dowry or gift you demand, I will gladly pay it. Just give me the girl as my wife. Notice in, back in verse 11, Shechem himself spoke to Dinah's father and brothers. Jacob was there. He's not absent here. He was there in body, but probably not there in heart and mind. Not once did both Hamar and Shechem thought it was wrong to rape Dinah, which really tells a lot to us about the Canaanites and their moral compass and how they treat their fellow human beings. They treat them like crap. No wonder Abraham and Isaac made every effort to not intermarry with these folks because they're just plain horrible. They're just not on the same page in morals and faith and in the way how they treat human beings. So not just rape, but also no remorse nor any respect for God's people's moral values. Hmm. Then how should the brothers respond to this? Let's move on to the brothers' response. But since Shechem had defiled their sister, Dinah, Jacob's sons responded deceitfully to Shechem and his father, Hamar. They said to them, we couldn't possibly allow this because you're not circumcised. Okay, what does that have to do with it? 
It would be a disgrace for our sister to marry a man like you. But here is a solution. If every man among you will be circumcised like we are, then we will give you our daughters and we'll take your daughters for ourselves. We will live among you and become one people. But if you don't agree to be circumcised, we will take her and be on our way. See, Dinah is still locked in the room. Again, the author emphasizes the word defiled. This is what the brothers were furious about. And this is what Jacob's supposed to be furious about. But did they consult with God first? Did they seek God's guidance on how to respond to this injustice that was done to their sister? No. In fact, the entire chapter, God was not mentioned. If Jacob only stepped in and provided some spiritual wisdom and guidance to these boys and led the way, taking the initiative in resolving this, the boys would not have treated circumcision, a covenantal symbol, a precious covenantal symbol between Abraham and God, as merely an ethnic symbol to be used to take revenge on Hamor and Shechem. They used circumcision for their own purposes. But Jacob remained absent, unfortunately, and so the boys took the matter into their own hands. Verse 18. Hamor and his son Shechem agreed to their proposal. Shechem wasted no time in acting on this request, for he wanted Jacob's daughter desperately. Oh my goodness, this guy is just has unsatiable desires. Shechem was a highly respected member of his family, and he went with his father, Hamor, to present this proposal to the leaders at the town gate. These men are our friends, they said. Let's invite them to live here among us and trade freely. Look, the land is large enough to hold them. We can take their daughters as wives and let them marry ours, but they will consider staying here and becoming one people with us only if all of our men are circumcised, just as they are. But if we do this, here's the catch that was not mentioned with the brothers. All their livestock and possessions will eventually be ours. Come, let's agree to their terms and let them settle here among us. That was not part of the deal, was it? But then they switched it in front of their own people. Hmm. Notice how Hamar and Shechem sold the idea to the city leaders. Basically, Hamar and Shechem told them that Jacob and his family will be theirs. Everything will be theirs. Shechem will, own, Shechem will own Jacob and all that he has, land, kids, wives, and everything. Bruce Walkey says this is basically proposing a cultural genocide. And that's no big deal for the Canaanites. And if it's just circumcision to get all that, why not? Tis but a nip on the tip, right? So, we also now know that Shechem and Hamar had ulterior motives with their proposal. They were not intending to share and have this nice NAFTA agreement between Jacob and themselves. No, they actually wanted to take over Jacob's entire family, land and livestock and wealth to be theirs. That's it. Let's move on. Verse 24. So all the men in the town council agreed with Hamar and Shechem. Eh, it's just tis a nip on the tip. And every male in the town was circumcised. But three days later, when their wounds were still sore, Two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's full brothers, took their swords and entered the town without opposition. Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamor and his son Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house and returned to their camp. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived. Finding the men slaughtered, they also plundered the town because their sister had been defiled there. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys everything they could lay their hands on, both inside it at the town and outside in the field. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took all their little children and wives and led them away as captives. Wow. Simeon and Levi were Dinah's immediate brothers from their mom Leah. While Hamor and Shechem and all the men were pretty much KO'd due to their circumcision, the two brothers went into town and killed all the men and freed Dinah. Dinah was locked in still until now. Brutal, isn't it? Instead of seeking God's guidance and wisdom, they proceeded the slaughter out of revenge. They used circumcision, a holy covenantal symbol, to use as a revenge, and they proceeded by slaughtering people. God was nowhere in their minds. Instead, they were furious and acted rashly from their fury because they deemed it as the right thing to do 
as opposed to seeking the right thing to do from God. When people do not seek God's direction and allow Him to determine what is the right action and take it up and take it upon themselves to determine what's right and just, often things don't turn out well because what's right for some may not be right for others. Our solution and actions always, always result in a zero sum, i.e. someone always loses. I hate to say it, but just off to a tangent as an example, just look at our protests. Each protest probably has, and most of the time, from my point of view, have good intentions. There are peaceful protesters. But what usually results in a prolonged protest? It's no longer peaceful. You have looters. You have people who have different ulterior motives. And someone always loses. Someone always loses. What's worse? The rest of the brothers plundered the city and took all the wives and children, which ironically was what Hamar and Shechem wanted to do. Speaking of protests, what else did they do? All the brothers plundered the city. So after this mass murder and plundering, which is completely opposite of their God-given vision of being a blessing to nations, you, you can't bless people when you kill them. And ushering them into God's presence, again, you can't usher people into God's presence when you kill them and loot them. What does Jacob do? How does he respond to this whole thing? How does he respond to his inaction, his passivity, his bystanding position? Let's take a look at verse 30. Afterward, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have ruined me! Great. What an ass. You've made me a stink among all the people of this land, among all the Canaanites and Perizzites. We are so few that they will join forces and crush us. I will be ruined and my entire household will be wiped out. I, I, me, me, oh, boo, boo, hoo. But why should we let him treat our sister like a prostitute? They retorted angrily. <laughs> Jacob, his response? Basically, he was scared for his life. Possibly the same reason initially why he didn't get involved in the first place. Because he was freaked out. He was scared for his life. When he initially got word from that Dinah, his own daughter was raped. Jacob for completely forgot about his God-given vision. His vow he made with God to go to Bethel and shirked on his responsibilities because he feared for his life. He settled because he feared for his life. And he didn't do anything because he feared for his life. How did Jacob, the guy who had a watershed moment at, in chapter 28, we thought it was great. He was heading the right direction now. He has a turning point, right? In fact, in the previous uh, sermon, what Dan preached, he seemed like he had good discernment. How could Jacob, the guy who had a watershed moment, was going along the right direction, giving us the readers hope that he would finally take on the role to lead God's people and become that patriarch, suddenly became a coward? shirking his responsibilities, which resulted in the annihilation of an entire city in the hands of his sons. Let's conclude. Like his granduncle Lot, when he got too comfortable with Sodom, Jacob got too comfortable with the culture and worldviews of Shechem, which resulted in him losing his moral compass and most importantly, his in tuneness with God. Notice that God was never mentioned in the entire chapter. So Jacob, basically, when he was immersed and got too comfortable and got too campy with the Canaanites, he lost his intuneship with God's voice and leading. Jacob and his sons basically showed us that God was nowhere in their minds because Jacob became callous when evil and injustice were blatantly in front of him, so callous that even when his own daughter was defiled, he didn't respond. He instead responded with the fear of his life, forgetting in chapter 28 that God would protect him and keep him safe from foreign nations. Hmm. What can we learn from this to conclude? Point one, why do we bystand? When we toy with sin, 
and become comfortable with the sin in our lives and not repent and be sensitive to it and to allow God to mold us, uh, convict us, and help us to turn around. Sin is no longer sin. Sin is no longer noticeable. But what's worse is that sin becomes a norm in our lives. We can't discern what's sin and what's not. See, here's the thing. If we continue, if we cheat on our taxes, and we cheat on our taxes every year and become it and make it a habit, or dishonesty, or lack of integrity, if we comp- continue to keep that as a habit, sooner or later, sub- it becomes subconscious. We lose sight of what we're doing. We don't even know that we're doing it. We don't even know that we're dishonest. Things just become normal. Things become so normal that we become like those around us, actually. Christians are given a moral compass that distinguishes us from the rest. What is this moral compass? This moral compass is Jesus. If we immerse ourselves with communities that are not Christ-centered, we lose our discernment of what pleases God and what doesn't please God, what is Christ-like and what isn't Christ-like. How can we possibly be God's agents of peacekeeping and justice and agents of justice if we can't distinguish what is right and wrong? So the first reason why I think we do not act on injustice and respond against evil and just take a spectator view or a bystanding position is because quite possibly we don't even know that it's wrong. We can't tell because we've been so immersed in our own sin and do not repent. Point number two. What's another reason why we bystand? See, Jacob was wired and equipped by God to be a leader. Spider-Man was wired and equipped with superpowers to prevent the thief from stealing money and consequently preventing the thief from killing his uncle. So Jacob was wired and equipped by the God to be a leader. He was empowered. God promised him that he will be with him in chapter 28. Promised to be with him, to be in his presence, to empower him to be the patriarch and leader, and to protect him. God promised that to fulfill Jacob's God-given vision. Jacob was to protect God's people and guide his people so that they remain holy and separated from the rest to fulfill God's purpose. He was given a God-given vision which came with great responsibility. Now, because Jacob feared for his life, he didn't trust God and left God out of the picture. He shirked his responsibilities and allowed his sons to take over who God did not originally appoint, nor did Jacob ever actually taught them how to do it. So what happened? They, the sons did it their way. The way they saw was right. Jacob, meanwhile, interestingly and probably unknowingly, said an interesting statement in response. Sure, he also feared his life, but what did he say? He said that he has now become a stink among the foreign nations. Stink? Wait, didn't God said that his people, Jacob, Israel, would be a blessing to the foreign nations and to usher them into the presence of God? Because Jacob shirked his responsibilities, in which he was wired to do, Instead of being a blessing, he became a stink. So when Jacob feared for his life, when Jacob just wanted to just be comfortable and just, you know, let life move on and just do his own thing and, you know, stay at home and raise a family and take care of kids and just do their job and maybe do some leisure activities and enjoy life, they become a stink. He became a stink. For Christians, we are called to be a blessing to those around us, right? Bringing peace and shalom to the world and ushering people to Jesus into God's presence. That's what blessing is. We are God's agents. And by his spirit, we are equipped to fulfill this responsibility, this great responsibility. If we see injustice and evil around us, We are equipped by the Holy Spirit and given the responsibility to respond in a Christ-centered way to bring Jesus 
into the injustice. But one thing for sure is that we cannot ignore our responsibility and just be a bystander and allow primitive re human responses do the work. We can't be a bystander and use an excuse saying, oh, I got work to do, or it's unsafe, or I do not have the capacity or the expertise to engage, or I don't have the time, or I have kids to, uh, to uh, raise. No, we are given the Holy Spirit and we were promised by God that he would protect us when we go in with a Jesus mindset and intervene, bringing Jesus into this injustice. We are given the Holy Spirit to do so. Because if we don't, we become a stink rather than a blessing. It could be a witnessing, a, you know, um, sorry. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. See, many of us, including myself, actually, I'm a culprit of that as well. You know, I, I have to point a finger at myself. Sometimes we see these injustice and it's overwhelming. It's like, oh man, it's so big. You know, especially the big ones on the news. But I'm not talking necessarily just that. There are a lot of injustices that are happening around in our neighborhood, in our communities, and in our families, amongst our friends. We see injustice, we see bullying, discrimination, stereotyping, and we see that happening. People are being, people's dignity is being removed. People's human, human existence is being defiled within our communities. And we are called to be a blessing. We are called to be the agents to have Jesus intervene through us into this injustice. We are to be a blessing because if we do not do that, we will become a stink as opposed to be a, as opposed to a blessing. See, in this lesson, in this passage, the lesson is that we are not to shirk away from our God-given responsibility, the great responsibility. Following Jesus comes great responsibility. We can't shirk from it. When we see wrongs, when we see injustice, we have to do something. We have to intervene. We have to intervene with prayer and we have to intervene in Jesus and through Jesus. Because if we don't, if we do not intervene, we become more of a stink than a blessing. Amen. Thank you.